And it's in that context that I wanted to invite up our keynote speaker tonight, Jerome Sauvage. Uh, Jerome, I will admit, is a, an old friend of mine since I worked in the United Nations Development Program for 31 years, and Jerome has been there about three decades as well. Jerome is currently, as you see, the Deputy Director of the Program Office in Washington, D.C. Pretty interesting to have a Frenchman, whom we honor, we have his flag somewhere nearby, uh, in the Washington, D.C. office to try to maintain relations with the international organizations in Washington, but also the U.S. government in particular. Jerome has been in a hot spot where peace and security have been debated, questioned in North Korea. He was the United Nations senior official in North Korea for three years before going to Washington and has served in such countries as Madagascar, which Lillian Koziel from the program office happens to come from. And Lillian, thank you. I'll use that as an occasion to diverge and say thank you for this evening and our partnership. And we brought Jerome to make you feel good. And we found out during the course of the evening that he was in Cambodia when some other guests are here, including uh, Peter Bartu, uh, who is a professor at Cal and teaches peace and conflict studies. So there are lots of links in Jerome's career to you, but also to the important work of the United Nations. So I'm very, very pleased, Jerome, that you're here. Come on up. He's had a tiring weekend. He flew out from Washington to be in Sacramento on Friday night to be in San Francisco last night. We're the ones who put it together, so you get the uh, frosting on the cake. Well, it's a huge honor for me to speak at the uh, International House and in San Francisco, which is this incredibly dynamic uh, UN association. Uh, part of my job is to talk to UN associations uh, in, in the United States, and uh, I've never seen uh, such an impressive uh, group, so I'm really very honored. I must say, also personally, I'm honored because uh, of a personal relationship with uh, this uh, UN association in some way. 69 years ago, a young student from Berkeley, um, a Chinese-American student, uh, who is now my mother-in-law, uh, had the vision of understanding the importance of uh, the UN Association. And my mother-in-law now lives in Los Angeles, and uh, she wanted to be a volunteer. Unfortunately, she, she could not be a volunteer 69 years ago, but uh, I wanted to tell, I will tell her on the phone today that uh, I have mentioned her name, uh, Joyce, as, as having been part of the UN Association, and she would be very happy. Thank you for bearing with me on this one. Um, her asked me to basically provide a bit of a framework to the three awards we're going to be giving today to incredibly fantastic, important organizations that are working every day for peace and human dignity. Those three organizations we're going to hear about uh, after my, my uh, presentation. So I'm supposed to provide a bit of the framework. What are the issues uh, that the United Nations sees as very important, um, new, uh, changing, I would say, and what it is that the UN and the rest of the international community is doing about these, these issues. Um, I'm a development guy. I mean, I've been mostly in the field like Herb, so I don't really have a big idea of uh, uh, what's going on in New York. Uh, mostly, I will talk about what I have experienced at the field level. Good job at working. <laughs> the UN today, and others, analysts, of course, see that what initially really led the creation of the UN in 1945, conflict, terrible conflict, and, and poverty, remain, obviously, most important preoccupations uh, in terms of our ability to answer those problems. But on top of it, there's a new dimension, and I will mention two aspects to this new dimension. The first one is climate change. Climate change today is a main driver of poverty and a main driver of conflict. 
in uh, India. I was posted in India for four years uh, in the state of Orissa. Uh, the, war, the weather is very extreme. From June to December, there's basically too much rain. The rice paddies are flooded, the roads are flooded, the, the, the villages are flooded. Then three months later, come March, there's not enough water to grow food. And the people in our state, in Orissa, are saying that they're witnessing these weather patterns to become more extreme. So what we're saying is, of course, climate change impact is going to impact the most vulnerable even more. So this is one of the preoccupations that we have. Another one is conflict. Uh, we are seeing that this, well, poverty is a driver of conflict, but so is climate change. A lot of conflicts around the world is basically coming out of access to water, access to energy, access to food, and those preoccupations that are exacerbated by climate change are also drivers of conflict. So climate change is a new dimension that we're seeing as really part of a triangle, if you will, of climate change, peace, and poverty uh, that need to be addressed through development. The cost of multiplying natural and man-made crises, uh, we have seen uh, how, uh, well, probably largely impacted uh, natural disasters. I'm thinking of Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. I'm thinking of the flood in the Balkan, one in a hundred year flood in the Balkans last year, uh, are certainly aggravated by, the, uh, by climate change. But in addition to that, we're seeing a cost to it which is tremendous. Last year alone, 2013, 22 billion dollars have been spent on natural disasters relief and peace relief alone. This year we're at 16 billion dollars already. And I hope we will not beat the record of the 22 billion dollars of 2013. But the cost is enormous in addition to lives lost, of course, loss of productive capacity, Losing development gains, there is also an actual cost to uh, doing uh, humanitarian relief. And the multiplication of crisis, I mean, do you remember Ukraine? That was not that long ago. Well, now we moved on to Iraq, ISIL, and uh, we have an impression that those man-made crises seem to be somehow accelerating. Uh, the, uh, uh, forget as a result, we're not even thinking of crises that are continuing the school girls of Nigeria, the Central African Republic, Mali, these are still going on and yet we have a sensation that crises are accelerating. So that is the second dimension we're seeing, a sense of accelerations of crises that are linked to poverty and to climate change. Partly. Now people say, can't the UN do more? And I say, yes, yeah, certainly the UN can do more. And uh, I will not give the usual, um, I should say, um, explanations about, well, you know, the Security Council and uh, it's difficult and it's political. Certainly we can do more. And one of the ways we can do more is by doing things differently. And that's why it's so important to see that your UN association has so many young people because they will be the one who will bring the innovations for change. I would propose three important things to, to think about when we address um, these, these crises. One, we need to get ahead of future crises and disasters. Avoid development setbacks and lives lost. This is about preparedness. This is about building the resilience of nations and communities to natural disasters and to conflict. Again, I will give an example of India. State of Orissa. Uh, last year, there was a major cyclone called Hud Hud. In Orissa in 1999, a similar cyclone happened, bringing 30,000 dead. Last year, cyclone Hudhud of a similar size, nobody heard about it. The story is that there is no story. The story is that the Indian government evacuated 200,000 people. They were able to make that effort through early warning system capacity of organizing a major evacuation at the level of New Delhi, at the decentralized level, at the state level, and the communities had disaster preparedness training and so on from the Red Cross, from NGOs, from UN, 
in order to be able to get prepared and move. I researched the facilities, the, the, the fatalities, uh, at, for trying to find how many people died in that cyclone. I think it is between 10 and 20 people. Uh, there was basically very little data on it because, as I said, there was no story. Um, another way, of course, in preparedness is peacekeeping. And there I would mention two parts of peacekeeping. One is obviously the 17 UN peacekeeping operations around the world um, cost $7.3 billion. United States is the biggest contributor to the peacekeeping operation, providing $350 million a year. I say that's a good investment. And um, we need to continue to support peacekeeping operations because it's good money spent. The other aspect of keeping the peace is to introduce inclusiveness in development. Let me explain. We are seeing certainly progress and good news on the number of people who are lifted out of poverty. Hundreds of millions of people, thanks to the work of the international community and the government themselves and the civil society themselves in those countries, are lifting people out of poverty. However, we are observing as a result within countries and between countries a sense of uh, the haves and have-nots. We still have a large number of people who remain in extreme poverty, a sense of increasing inequality. That increasing inequality can be a driver for conflict. And as a result, we need to rethink, and that's why I need to involve many people, the young people, the development programs have to be more inclusive, bringing in all the parts of population. First of all, women and youth, which honestly, so far, development programs have been somewhat a little bit wooden and doing uh, their programs without really including uh, all the members of the population. Thirdly, I was describing the interaction between climate change and poverty and uh, conflict. We need to avoid working in silos. The development programs uh, have to be more inclusive, bringing poverty, climate, uh, and also justice, access to justice, good governance, democratic governance, in order to be sure that those programs are inclusive, don't leave anyone behind, and that the people feel that they can have access to justice and access to their rights. And of course, we need to shift the spending, those $22 billion that we spend on humanitarian relief and peacekeeping after the fact, we need to shift them to building the capacity, the resilience of those nations and the resilience of those communities, as I have described the case of uh, Orissa in India. Well, what framework? Um, all this is very nice, but we need to make sure that uh, the, the international community, the governments, the civil society are working together in one direction. We have the Minimum Development Goals, eight goals. Pretty nice, 2015, lots of progress, a um, lot of people getting out of poverty, partly due to the efforts of Millennium Development Goals. Education, pretty good, a lot, of, a lot more kids are more in school, but it, I would call it unfinished business. Um, still a lot of people in extreme poverty. Still about 60 million kids don't go to school. Marginal mortality, child mortality, these are the goal MDG4 and MDG5, not achieved. Still a lot of work to be done in this area. And so on and so forth. So, pretty good, not an A, B, B minus, B plus, I don't know what the Berkeley professor would decide on that one. Therefore, what has been happening is since the MDGs are finishing in 2015, and of course we will get a scorecard prepared to know exactly what has been achieved, the world has been engaged in a fascinating discussion on what is the world we want from 2015 to 2030. The discussion has taken place at the government level, the United Nations, and also at the people level. Uh, the Secretary General's website the world we want, www.worldwewant.com, has had millions of people expressing what it is that they want. And it's very interesting, uh, some of the results. People have been saying, 
I want education, I want health. They've also been saying, I want a government that ensures my security. I want a government that provides services to the people. So people know what they want, and so we need to listen to them. The, um, as a result, we're getting a post-2015 agenda. This is going to be an agenda that will have a gained goal. This agenda has certain aspects that is a bit different from the previous MDGs. One, it's going to be very transformational, focusing on trying to get targets that try to change things. Two, it's actually universal. Every country in the world will be part of those sustainable development goals. Three, it's going to be sustainable, meaning we will have to achieve those goals within nature's boundaries. In other words, they have to be sustainable. And uh, inspirational, i.e., the idea is that it's not just a business of the government. We're supposed to light the fire under the feet of those governments through civil society to be sure that they are telling their uh, um, citizens what it is they're doing to meet those goals. I will not go to this, uh, for the moment, these 17 goals. I will not go to each of them. But as regard sustainability, climate change, there are two goals, 14 and 15. 14 is for the defense of the oceans, and 15 is for the defense of ecosystems. And what's important is the targets. Inside, you have a specific target to say, you know, reduction of, uh, you know, gas house by so much. And as you can imagine, the other big event of next year is the Paris uh, 2015 meeting, in which we really hope that the governments will come together in a post-Tokyo mode. Post-Tokyo, is that Kyoto? Kyoto agreement, sorry. Uh, Post-Kyoto, in which the countries are going to agree on a number of targets. The targets that will be in Paris will have to be consistent with the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals. And the other set of goals I want to mention is goals for peace. They are in the SDGs uh, goals for peace with specific targets. I don't remember the number. I'm sure Elise knows those numbers. But um, we, uh, we are therefore, uh, we, there are those goals. Now, what are the next steps? In July 2014, the governments of the world, and by the way, I would like to recognize the fact that uh, the State Department, I think, has been working closely with UN Association, and particularly closely with your UN Association, to know what are the focus uh, areas and priorities that you respect, that you require. Um, the Open Working Group, meaning all the various representative governments, have handed a report to the UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon. He's working on it. I think he's going to have to reduce some of his goals. Obviously, 17 goals is very hard to accomplish. He's going to try to sort of put things together. I'm not sure what will survive. Um, we are awaiting the UN Secretary General sometimes in, uh, in 2015, early 2015, at which point the countries are going to work on it. And the hope is that in September 2015, at the UN General Assembly in New York City, they will sign the Sustainable Development Goals. And that will be basically the start of the real world. There are unknowns. For example, will sexual and reproductive health goal survive? Uh, the concern of some of the countries which are less uh, um, supportive of this particular set of goals. Another unknown is, will the developing country governments have the capacity to deal with this laundry list of things they're supposed to accomplish? And that's where we come in. UNDP has all these practice areas, and I will not go through them, don't worry. But one of the role of the UNDP, which is my agency, is to be a coordinator of the field, at the field level of the UN system. And so what we do is we work with the government and the other partners in the international community and with the civil society, and we put together a document called the UN Development Assistance Framework, UNDAF. That UNDAF is a framework, and in it, the, the goals, the sustainable development goals, will be introduced specifically adjusted to the particular government in which we work in. We work in 177 countries. And so our job is going to be to support those governments to accomplish those goals and to uh, also work with civil society 
to make sure that there's a movement in every country that supports the sustainable development goals. So I am very um, hopeful, very excited, and as I said at the beginning, as a development person at the field level, I think it will help us in trying to focus everybody's attention so that whether it's bilateral aid like USAID, NGOs, and UN, we are trying to work together in one direction towards the sustainable development goals. So thank you very much, and uh, best of luck, and I, I think I'm supposed to do a happy United Nations Day. Thank you very much.